I've been given the task to try to explain what happened back on 9-11. And you saw those images up there, and I think most of you, that was probably the first time that you even heard about radical Islam. Am I right? For most of you didn't know what radical Islam was. Now, my task tonight, and I've been given this, is to try to give some background to what happened there and to try to understand who these radical Muslims are. Uh, these are the ones that I have worked with for almost 25 years. I have been, uh, we were sent to London, England back in 1992, my wife and I, to engage the radical Muslims because at that time we knew about them, but no one else seemed to know about them. I was born in India, I grew up in India, northern India, where there are around 200 million Muslims. You don't think of India as a Muslim country, you think of it as a Hindu country, am I correct? 800 million Hindus, but there's 200 million Muslims living in India. And that's where I was born, that's where my father was born, my grandparents. I, my family has been in India since 1913. And we've all lived in, world, we're in the most densely Muslim area of India. It is the third largest Muslim country on earth, soon to be the second largest and eventually the first largest because the Muslim population is growing much faster than any other. So I've grown up with Islam. I've had it all around me. My parents have grown up with Islam. I was spent my first 17 years living amongst Muslims, had them as roommates, had them as classmates. And so we were sent to London to really engage with this uh, term radical Islam. So what I want to do tonight is I want to unpack it, show you a little bit about it, and help you understand the roots behind it and why it's not something that will just come and go. And it's something that's been here for a long time. Not here, not in California, obviously, but certainly in the world. So let's go ahead. Uh, the images you saw, I don't know, could we uh, maybe get rid of some of these lights up here so we can see this, or can you see it all right from the audience? If you can see it okay, then we'll just go through it. You all remember these images. These are some of the images, the people in the windows on the left, the, fa the falling man on the right, the responders, the first responders. And that's the building that's now replaced it. And they call it One World Trade Center. It's there now. That's what's been erected from the ashes. So how do we explain ISIS? How do we explain Al-Qaeda? How do we explain these groups like Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, jamaat e islami Tabikli Jamaat? The names go on and on and on. There's many of them. There's not just one group. It's many, many groups. And how do we explain what happened in 9-11? How do we explain situations like these? The vehicular jihads. These are the ones that are... Uh, that you have seen in the news in Nice, in Ohio, Berlin, Jerusalem, Westminster, Stockholm, Manchester, London, where they are now using vehicles, not planes and not necessarily weapons uh, that we would normally use, but just vehicles to kill people. Or what do we do with a man like this, Jihadi John, Muhammad al-Mansi? He is from London. In fact, he lived about six miles from where I lived. He knew me. I didn't know him. He used to come down to Speaker's Corner where I would be every Sunday. I'm, uh, I've just come back from Speaker's Corner. I was there last Sunday, three days ago. That's why my voice is right back. Because when you're at Speaker's Corner for two and a half hours, you have to go full tilt. And I have been at Speaker's Corner for 25 years. It's only on Sundays, and I go and I take on sometimes hundreds of radical Muslims at a time. If you're ever in London on a Sunday, go to Speaker's Corner. We have a whole team down there. Uh, I've now left London. I now live in America for the last two years, but I go back to London about every uh, once or twice a year just to engage with the Muslims there to keep me honed in. But he used to come to Speaker's Corner. He was the one that did the, he, did, he was the one known as Jihadi John who did the atrocities against the social workers and the journalists. We have many British Muslims who joined ISIS, Thomas Evans, Abdul Hakim, Taha. A smile, if you notice, he's raising one finger up, pointing to God. That was seconds before he blew himself up. And that's what the signal of oneness of God, Tawheed. God is one. The Dawood sisters who took nine children to go from Bradford and live in Syria. 
So we've had a particular problem in Britain, but also France has had a similar problem. According to Prime Minister Manuel Valls, there were 15,000 people who were being monitored for radicalization, 10,000 were identified as high risk. France has been under a state of emergency since ISIS killed 130 in November 2015. So it's a problem particular to Europe that you haven't really had here in the States yet. It may come. We'll see. Your former president, Barack Obama, said, ISIS or ISIL is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents, and the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. Our prime minister, David Cameron, not anymore, but for, uh, during this, the, the atrocity, said, we are in the midst of a generational struggle against an ideology which is an extreme distortion of the Islamic faith. But I doubt if David Cameron has ever read the Quran. And that's what we want to do tonight. We want to look and see if these are correct. Baroness Warsi, the most uh, senior uh, bar uh, Baroness in the House of Lords, s said this. She is a Muslim herself. She said, extremists are high on drugs and drink, people with personal issues and losers, done mostly by converts trying to gain credibility. All faiths have their fair share of crazies. In other words, it's not just Muslims. There are also crazy Christians. In fact, every faith has its crazy. Do you agree with her? MI5, which is the, would be the British equivalent to your uh, CIA, believes that these uh, extremists are nothing more than mentally ill, criminal types with previous convictions, unable to keep jobs. They are attracted to extremist groups who offer them money, status, and a cause. Interestingly, almost every one of the extremists who have attacked in Britain don't fit any of those typologies, don't fit any of those criteria. Jihadi John, who you saw earlier, Mwazi, he was actually, uh, came from a, a middle-class family. He went to one of the best schools in London. You saw a picture with his uniform on. He had everything to live for. So why did he join ISIS? And why did he do those atrocities there in Syria? The very Reverend John Hall said after the atrocity that happened at Westminster Bridge, what could possibly motivate a man to drive a car fast at people he had never met? It seemed likely that we shall never know. That night, Douglas Murray in The Spectator wrote this. Douglas Murray is a debater. He is an atheist. He um, is actually a, a very well-known uh, prota pro 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 protagonist against Islam. And he says, after last month's attack in Westminster, there seemed to be an even more concerted effort than usual to say that the perpetrator, a Muslim convert called Khalid Masood, probably suffered from some mental illness, was a mere madman, criminal, or drug addict. Various Muslims who knew Masood promised in the media that he had, hadn't really been religious at all. This swiftly became the story. Man drives car into pedestrians on Westminster Bridge and stabs a policeman to death. Nothing to see here, certainly nothing to do with Islam. Probably to do with everything else in the world, but nothing to do with Islam. You can see he's been ironic. And there is a confusion. Major General Michael K. Nagata, the Special Operations Commander for the United States in the Middle East, admitting that he had hardly begun figuring out the Islamic State's appeal, said, we have not defeated the idea, we do not even understand the idea. So why is the West so confused? I asked this when I was in India a number of years ago, and I remember the Indian, an Indian convert said to me, Mr. Smith, you don't understand it yet. You in the West, here in the United States and in Britain, you've really only had Muslims around for about 40 years. We in India have had them for 1,400 years. We understand them much better than you. So who understands them best, the East or the West? Let's look at these. Let's see what the opinions are of some influential Muslims. Ayatollah Khomeini, 1902 to 1989. And this is what he said. Islam makes it incumbent on all adult males, provided they are not disabled or incapacitated, to prepare themselves for the conquest of other countries, so that the writ of Islam is obeyed in every country in the world. But those who study Islamic holy war will understand why Islam will want to conquer the whole world. Those who know nothing about Islam pretend that Islam counts counsels against war. Those who say this are witless. Islam says, kill all the unbelievers, just as they would kill you all. Does this mean that Muslims should sit back until they are devoured by the unbelievers? Islam says, kill them, the non-Muslims, 
put them to the sword, and scatter their armies. Does this mean sitting back until non-Muslims overcome us? Islam says, kill in the service of Allah those who may want to kill you. Does this mean that we should surrender to the enemy? Now, how many here in this room believe that? Does Islam say to kill the unbelievers? Where do you find that? You have to go to the Quran. Surah 8, Ayah 39. Kill the unbelievers until there is no more fitna. That means no more unbelief until all believe in Allah. Chapter 9, verse 5. Kill the unbelievers, slay them, besiege them, lay in wait for them with every kind of ambush. That's known as a sword verse. Chapter 9, verse 29. Make war on Al-Kitab. Al-Kitab would be the people of the book. That's us, Christians and Jews. Chapter 47, verse 4. Cut off the heads of the unbelievers. The first three verses talks about who a believer is and who an unbeliever is. Verse 4 then says to cut off the heads. Then it continues on in verse 5, 6. And he who participates in jihad, if he should die, great shall be his reward in heaven. Stipulating that anybody who kills an unbeliever is in the process of killing another believer. If they should die, they should go straight to heaven. Now remember, Islam has no assurance of salvation. We do. Islam does not, except for chapter 47, verse 6, which stipulates if you die in the service of Allah doing jihad, you go straight to heaven. Can you then understand when you read the Quran properly, when you read it and exegete it correctly, then you have verses like this, why so many young men are volunteering to do just that. Amit Tahiri, the Iranian author based in uh, Europe's chairman of the Gatestone Institute, said this, Islam says, whatever good there is exists thanks to the sword. In the shadow of the sword, people cannot be made obedient except with the sword. The sword is the key to paradise, which can be opened only for the holy warriors. There are hundreds of Quranic psalms and hadiths, sayings of the prophet, urging Muslims to value war and to fight. Does all this mean that Islam is a religion that prevents men from waging war? I spit upon those foolish souls who make such a claim. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, referring and re uh, responding to the term moderate Islam, said these descriptions are very ugly. It is offensive and an insult to our religion. There is no moderate or immoderate Islam. Islam is Islam, and that's it. Back in 2004, look at the date, July 7, 2004. In Britain, they wanted to find a moderate face of Islam, and they invited this gentleman, Yusuf Karadawi, from Qatar. He is uh, on Al Jazeera television every night. You can still see him today. They flew him into Heathrow Airport to speak about modernist, moderate Islam. Ken Livingston, who is the mayor at that time, uh, brought him in as a moderate face. And the first question that was asked him at the, uh, at the meeting there at the airport was, what do you think about suicide bombers? And his response was very quick. Islam permits suicide bombers, and he referred to chapter 8, verse 60 in the Quran. And he says, because of the fact that if you have, are in a battle and you have no weapons or steeds of war, as it says in chapter 8, 60, you can use your bodies. And without even being asked, he then went on to say that it's perfectly good for men to beat their wives. That's in chapter 4, verse 34. And it's perfectly okay to, he said, kill the homosexuals. Actually, he should have said to beat them a hundred lashes. That's in chapter 24, verse 2. They had to close down the press conference, and they gave him no more TV time. And the reason why is because they didn't look and see who he was. See, had they looked at his background, they would have realized that that uh, Yusuf Karadawi was a student of Said Qutb, also a student of Ayman Zawahiri, both of the Muslim Brotherhood. He himself is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, one of the, the theologians for the Muslim Brotherhood. And all he had to do was quote scripture after scripture after scripture, verse after verse after verse, straight out of the Quran. Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad and Anjum Chaudhry are two friends of mine. Don't, get the, don't be upset by that. They are the two most radical Muslims in Britain, uh, have been since 1993. Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad on the left is actually from Syria. He tried to overthrow the government there, and then he fled to London. And, of course, the British government gave him a house, uh, housed uh, school, all his five children, gave him free medical treatment, as Britain always does for radical Muslims. When I was on campus there in 1992, I would go from college to campus to college, university to campus to university to campus, and I'd go to all the Islamic society uh, um, meetings I could. I always, always, they would always be advertised on the bulletin board. 
and I would be the only white person there, certainly the only non-Muslim. And to begin with, back in the 1992, 1993, there would maybe only be 20 or 30 students at every meeting. When he came into the meetings, when he came to each one of the universities, suddenly these groups grew to two to 300 and they had to meet in rooms like this, large assembly rooms, because they to accommodate the crowds he brought. And the reason he was so attractive and the reason he was so, uh, um, uh, well, the reason why so many students started following him is because every time he spoke, he just opened up the Quran and he read verse after verse after verse, supporting everything he said. His lieutenant is Anjum Chowdhury on the right. He is a lawyer and he is now the head of the Muhajirun Party, the most radical group there in Britain. And I used to go and attend their meetings and we became good friends, I have Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad and I. He invited me to go and teach at his classes there in North London, in Tottenham. He was known as the Ayatollah of Tottenham. And the first time he ever introduced me to his students, he said, this is my favorite Christian, but this will be the first man I kill when Islam comes to Britain. What an introduction. And I had no problem with that introduction because he would have to kill me first because of what I believed and who I stood for, Jesus Christ. And he knew that, and I was just as radical as he is. But I went back to another revelation, not to Quran, but the Bible. Anjum Chaudhry says this, there is a struggle between the people of Shaitan, that's the Cameron, our prime minister at that time in the Killiam Project, and those of Allah, the Muslims there in Britain. And Allah is on our side, so we will win. The speech of Mr. Cameron, the prime minister at that time, was an attack against Muslims, not extremism, he wants Muslims to give up the idea of Khilafah, which is the Islamic State, Sharia, which is the law, and Jihad, which is striving for Allah. There is no Islam without ruling by that which Allah has revealed, Al-Khilafah, and removing obstacles in the way of implementing the Sharia, bringing it in. So there are two responses. You have Anjum Chaudhry on the left that I just quoted, and then you have a very westernized Muslim like Irshad Manji from Canada, who is a homosexual herself and is now has become an imam of a mosque. She has written Allah, Liberty, and Love, and is highly praised and is loved by the liberal West. And she gets into all kinds of uh, certainly chat shows, but she is not invited to any other mosque but her own, and that's the problem. She represents what the West wants, but she does not represent what Islam is. And that's why this divide now is separating the two. There is a tug of war within Islam. You have the traditionalists on the left and you have the modernists on the right. Anjim Chaudhry on the left, Irshan Manji on the right. And the Irshan Manjis of the world have to remain in the West. They cannot, they dare not go to an Islamic country. They would not be welcome there. They would not probably leave alive. So how do moderates interpret the Quran? And this is something I've always had. People come up to me and say, yes, but Islam is a religion of peace. I remember I was in the House of Lords. We were, uh, I was with Baroness Cox, and we were trying to shut down Islamic courts. I don't know if you know, but in Britain, we now have 80 Islamic courts that are legitimate courts uh, that have been inter inculcated within, under uh, British laws as of 2009. And these courts are now growing. There will be soon over 100. And we want to shut them down because of what they're doing to women, especially what they're doing to women. While we were there in that meeting, uh, Lord Ahmed came in, and he was the senior lord of the House of Lords, and he put down his books, and he turned to us, and he says, what is your problem? Islam is a religion of peace. For you have heard it say there is no compulsion in religion. And I raised my hand, and I said, Lord Ahmed, do you know where that verse is from? He said, no, I'm not a theologian. I said, then why are you quoting it? That's from chapter 2, verse 256. I said, have you read the rest of the verse? Have you read the verse that follows it? Because if you read the rest of the verse, you will see very clearly that those who stand against Allah and his prophet, for their reward shall be in hellfire. Now tell me if there's no compulsion. And that has nothing to do with me. That has everything to do with you. Do not quote that verse. Now, in Islam, there, is, there are verses about the closest verse you'll get to uh, peace would be this one here, chapter 109, verse 1 to 6. Unto you your religion and unto me my religion which is right at the end of the Quran. There are only 114 chapters. When you look at that, you will say, well, that's pretty good until you realize that you have the, what they call law of abrogation. In the Quran, there are many, about 200 verses that contradict each other. And so a law of abrogation has been imposed into the Quran in chapter 2, verse 106, and chapter 16, verse 101. 
And the difficulty with that is when you get these abrogations, you've got to know what to do with it. In ch chapter 2, verse 106 and 6101 stipulate that referring to God himself, saying that which we give, mansuk, which is prior, weak, we give something better, nasik, which is strong. And the nasik therefore abrogates the mansuk. And when you look at the Quran, if you just flit it in half, the first half would be the Medinan surahs, the second half would be the Meccan surahs. The Meccan were revealed first between 610 and 622. The Medinan surahs were revealed from 622 to 632, the last 10 years of the Prophet's life. Now, if you have Mansuk versus Nasik, and Nasik abrogates Mansuk, then that means all the Medinan verses abrogate the Meccan verses. Are you getting confused? Don't worry. A lot of Muslims get confused as well. But radical Muslims don't. Because they know all the, the violent verses are in the Medinan surahs, not in the Meccan surahs. This verse, 106, that I just showed you is in the Meccan surahs. It is abrogated by 101 verses that come after it. Lord Ahmed, after he did that, he said, well, listen, it is true that in the Quran somewhere it says that if you are attacked, defend yourself, but do not go beyond the limits. And I said, do you know where that is? And I, he said, no, I'm not a theologian. I told you that already. I said, that's in chapter 2, verse 190. And I said, have you read what follows after it? Because if you want to know what the limits are that you're not to go behind, read what follows it. Those who fight you do not transgress limits, however, and slay them wherever you catch them and fight them until they prevail faith in Allah. Now I said to him, what limits do you not transgress once you've killed me? I'm already dead. Read the whole verse. This is not a peaceful verse. This is very violent. It tells you exactly what you're to do to me. And then he finished up with chapter 5, verse 32, which is a favorite of every politician, which stipulates, O children of Israel, he who takes the blood of one is if he takes the blood of all, but he who saves the blood of one is if he saves the blood of all. Have you heard this one before? This was Obama's favorite verse. This has also been the favorite verse of many of our politicians in Britain. It sounds like a redemption analysis on the blood of whom? Well, you look at the verse before, verse 31. It's the story of Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother Abel, doesn't know what to do with the body, sees a raven scratching in the ground, and so follows the result of the, of the raven and buries his own brother. This verse that follows it, then, is an analysis of the blood of Abel. And it starts with, O oh, children of Israel. And I said to Lord Ahmed, are you a child of Israel? And he balked at that. He says, of course not. I said, well, then this verse has nothing to do with you. This is for Jews, only Jews. You need to go to the next verse that follows it, verse 33, which says very clearly, the recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and do mischief in the land is only that they shall be killed or crucified and their hands and their feet cut off on opposite sides or be exiled from the land. Therefore, if you stand against Allah and his messenger, be careful, you must be crucified and have your hands and feet cut off. I said, that's the verse you should have read because that's to do with us. That's to do with you. And that's to do with Muslims, because we're not Jews. The problem of radicalization is how do you interpret these verses? What are you supposed to do with the Quran? Is it just a book or is it a divine edict? And that's the question that many Muslims are asking. Now, to understand radicalism, you need to go right to the very beginning. And the word radical means just that, doesn't it? Radical means root. A radical number is a root number. Am I correct? So why don't we go back to the root? Now, there are two suppositions in the West that such a suggest that to understand radicalism, yeah, well, there are two viewpoints in the West, and I, I'm sure it's in the church as well. It may be even in this room. And the, the first view is that radicalism is a very new phenomenon. It has only been around since basically the, the creation of the state of Israel in 1948. Therefore, it's only been around for, well, not even 100 years. It's a very new phenomenon. It's because of what's happened there in Israel, that radicalism was formed. And the second view is that radicalism is not due. It's been around since the very beginning of Islam, since 624, when the Khilafat was initiated. Let's look at the first one. Radicalism is new. It's a reaction against geopolitical circumstances, primarily created because of what happened in Israel in 1948, and then, of course, what has happened more recently in Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003. And that's why it is... It, it's, it, is, it is nothing that has existed prior to those dates. It is very political. Therefore, since it is political, these are all political problems, we need a political solution. 
So the problem with, for the church is, what are we to do with radical Islam? Since it's a political problem, that's not our remit. We're not to be involved in politics. Remember Christ said to separate church and state. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. So therefore, as a church, we don't belong to Caesar. Therefore, it's Caesar's problem. It's the state's problem. What are we to do with it? Well, possibly, should we just ignore it? Maybe try to fight it, but we can't since we don't have the weapons of this world. Therefore, throw money at it, or do we just find common ground with it? And these are the reactions that I'm hearing in the church today. They don't know what to do with radical Islam. There's very few people that even talk to radical Muslims. When I was in Britain, I was the only one. And for 25 years, I've been the only one in Britain. Here in the States, radical Islam really hasn't come here, so there's not really a problem yet. Yet. Now, I'm in the other camp, obviously, as you can see. I'm from this camp that believes that radical Islam has been here from the very beginning. It's not something that's just been since here since 1948. And that's why we need to go to the root itself. And to do that, you need to start with Muhammad. You need to read his biography. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to read his biography, but if you want to read his biography, you need to go to Ibn Hisham, who died in 833, or al waqidi who died in 835. So his biography is written 200 years after he died because he died in 632. Nonetheless, that's the earliest material we have on Muhammad's life. And when you look at his life, you will see immediately that he started the Khilafat in 624. He was in Medina. He had moved there in 622, and immediately he opposed the Jews that were already there, the Banu Kainuka family, the Banu Nadir family, and the Banu Quraiza family, the three Jewish families. He eradicated them, threw them out, and the final Banu Quraiza family, he took all 800 men and slit their throats in one afternoon in 627. How many of you have heard this before? Just six or seven of you. Now, isn't that odd that you've never heard these stories before about one of the greatest men in the history of mankind and the one that you're going to be up against? Why aren't they teaching this in your schools? This is the lie of Islam. They're, you're not permitted to teach this in your schools because it's not politically correct. And yet those biographies are there for you to read. And until you find Muhammad's life, until you look and see who he was and what he did, you will never know what you're up against. Because radical Islam always goes back and starts with Muhammad. The reason why is very simple. Look at yourself. Now, when you preach here on a Sunday morning, do you preach from the Bible? Does your pastor preach from the Bible? Please say yes. <laughs> at least he opens it up, right? And he reads it. Does he apply it to your life? Does he go back to Jesus Christ? Does he talk about him? About what he did? About what he said? Whew, you've passed that test. We demand that of our pastors, do we not? You cannot be a Protestant pastor today anywhere in the world without opening the Bible. You better open the Bible when you're at the pulpit. Why? Because we go to the Bible for our authority, and we go to Jesus Christ as our model. Am I correct? Say yes, of course we do. Well, if that's the case then we start with a book modeled by a man. The book and the man, the book and the man, the book and the man. Islam starts from the same paradigm. They go to another book, a smaller book, modeled by another man, a smaller man. The book is the Quran, the man is Muhammad. The book and the man, the book and the man. Since we start from the same paradigm, can you then understand why we can understand them the best? And that's why we have a unique opportunity, because we understand exactly why radical Muslims go back to the root. You have to go back to the man, Muhammad himself. He defeats the Jews by 627. There were no Jews left in Medina. He was not from Medina. He was from Mecca. He had only been in Medina for five years. All the Jews were eradicated, either thrown out or had their throats slit. The women were taken as concubines for his men and the children as slaves. And yet we've never read this out in our schools. I'm just telling it to you for the first time. In 632, he then dies. And that was where the Khilafat began. It began in 624. He initiated the Khilafat there in Medina. Now, immediately after, you have what they call the Rashidun period, which is the period from 624 to 661. He dies in 632, and then you have Abu Bakr who takes over from 632 to 634. He dies normally. He's the first Caliph. Umar takes over from 634 to 644 for the next 10 years. Then he is killed from 644 to 656. Uthman takes over, and he is killed in 656. And Ali is the fourth caliph. He takes over from 656 to 661, just five years. He is killed. So the last three of the four rightly guided caliphs is killed. But that is the golden age of Islam from 624 to 661. 
that roughly 40-year period. And that's what the radical Muslims want to get back to. If you talk to any radical Muslim, if you read any of their textbook, if you talk to them face to face, they all talk about the Rashidun period, the golden age of Islam, the age of the four rightly guided caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, of course, Muhammad before that. That's why we need to wake up and listen and go right back to the root. To understand real Islam, you've got to go back to real Islam. You've got to go back to their history. Now, post Rashidun, you have Abu Hassan al Mawardi, 972 to 1058. The Ordinance of Government of the Religious Position, Sunni Islamic Political Thought, codified the political edifice of Islam, and it talked about the seven criteria for a caliph, the king. It, 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 he was the one that enforced the jizya tax and wouldn't permit any building of temples, churches, or synagogues. But that's the 10th century. But really to understand radical Islam, though you need to start with Muhammad, you need to go really back to this man, Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah is probably the best name, and all my radical friends, they all quote him. And the reason why, he was the one that codified this idea of going to one book modeled by one man, the Book of the Man. He said, to be a good Muslim, read the book. To understand the book, follow the man. It's as simple as that. Look at the date, 1300s. 200 years later in Germany, we had a man named Martin Luther who said much the same thing, did he not? To be a good Christian, read the book, Sola Scriptura. The book is the Bible. To understand the Bible, read, follow Jesus Christ, the book and the man. That's my phrase, book and the man. That wasn't his. But can you see how we call that our reformation? And many most people are saying, when is Islam going to have its reformation? They had the reformation with this man right here, Ibn Taymiyyah. Because every Muslim today who is a radical Muslim goes back to Ibn Taymiyyah. Case in point, just look what happened in 1700. When these two men, one is Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahib. Wahib was an Arab himself. He was living there in Medina uh, in Central Arabia. Shah Wahihullah came from India. He came to study there, and he was studying Ibn Taymiyyah's material there in Arabia. 1700, look at the year, 1700. We're talking about 400 years ago. They were studying Wahiwullah from the 1300s. Now, Wahab stayed in Arabia, amalgamated himself with a family, a very prominent family called the Ibn Saud family. The Ibn Saud family then eradicated all their opponents, took over the entire Arabian Peninsula, and created what we now know today as Saudi Arabia, giving their name to the country. But they only had political power in order to get religious or theological legitimacy, they needed to bring Wahhab in as their theologian. And that's why Wahhabism then was created. But look at the dates, 1700. That's 400 years ago. And that's why Wahhabism now is all over the Muslim world today. Created by this man on the left, who basically was just reiterating what Ibn Taymiyyah had said in the 1300s. Meanwhile, Wahiwulu on, on the right went back to India, went back to Bihar, where my parents used to live, where my grandparents used to live. And he started these madrasas there. When the British came and colonized India, and at that time, India was Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, all three countries, they came across many of his disciples, had a, such a problem with them that they shot them, they pushed them right across northern India, up into western India, up in the mountains called the Waziristan, what is today Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that's where they've remained ever since, because of the British. Let's jump to the 20th century. There in India, you have two men whose names are probably the most prominent. One is Muhammad Ilyas al Kandlawi, who was there in Delhi. He started the Tabikli Jamaat in 1926. The Tabikli Jamaat is probably one of the most radical groups in the world today. They have now grown and grown and grown. They're in 100 and, 120 countries. They have a membership of 80 million. 80 million. That's the population of Britain right there. How many have heard this name before? None of you. And these are the Tabikli Jamaat that I have to contend with. Almost all the radicals we have in Britain are coming out of that group. The four men that blew themselves up in 2005, July 7th, 2005. Remember I told you to remember that date when Yusuf Qaradawi came to Heathrow Airport, July 7th, 2004, and said it was perfectly legitimate for people in Britain to blow themselves up, quoting from chapter 8, verse 60. Exactly a year to the date later, those four men went to London, came to London. I was in London. I was there when it happened. Blew themselves up and killed 52 people on three trains and one bus. See, you in America haven't had what we've had in Britain. We've been hit right, left, and center. We've had suicide bomber after suicide bomber, and none of them, none of them are Christians. 
every one of them have been Muslims. They've all come to our country almost entirely from the Indian subcontinent, from where these men come from. Abdul Allah Maldudi lived in Deoban. I used to live in, when I was growing up, I was in Masuri, and I'd go down to visit my parents. We'd stop in Deoban, our train would be there, and these madrasas on either side of the railway tracks. At that time, I didn't know exactly who they were. I saw all these Muslims. I didn't really understand the, the importance of what I was seeing. But he was there in Deoband, and he then, in 1947, when India got its independence, he moved to Pakistan, it was called West Pakistan at that time, and started the jamaat islamic group. Now, that jamaat islamic group has then grown and grown and grown there in Pakistan. Uh, they have been training up these hundreds of thousands of, actually millions, 1.7 million Talibes every year are graduated from those schools. 1.7 million students, that's what a Talibe means. They are the ones that then moved out of Pakistan, moved into Afghanistan, attacked the Russians, and took over Afghanistan as the Taliban. The Taliban are nothing more than Talibes. The Talibes are the students of Maududi from the 1900s, not even 100 years ago. And that's why they got rid of the Russians. And then let's jump over now to Arabia, over there in Egypt specifically. We have a man named Hassan al-Banna, who in 1920 started the Muslim Brotherhood. He died in 1948. He was executed by Gemal al-Nasr. The Muslim Brotherhood took Wahab's material, who had taken what Ibn Taymiyyah had said in the 1300s, Wahab in the 1700s, then made it popular by Hassan al-Banna by in the Brotherhoods. The Muslim Brotherhood that still exists today started in the 1920s by this man. His favorite student was Zayd Qutb. Zayd Qutb had memorized the Quran by the time he was 10 years old. The Quran is about the same size as our New Testament. How many of you could have memorized the New Testament by the time you were 10 years old? You could have? You did? You almost read it? Well, here's a real prodigy right here in our midst. Be careful of her, because look what happened to Zayd Qutb. I didn't mean to put pressure on you. Zayd Qutb then became such a prodigy and such a problem for Abu Ghadr al-Nasr that he put him in prison in 1956. And between 1956 and 1966, that 10 year period, Said Qutb wrote two books, In the Shade of the Quran and Milestone. In the Shade of the Quran, all it did is to go through the Quran and exegete all the different scriptures, verse by verse by verse, and apply it to the 20th century. It is the textbook for all radical Muslims. All my radical Muslim friends have read that. It's in every language, every known language. Milestones is a much more uh, codified form, and in 1966, he was then executed by Nasser, became a martyr for the cause. Ayman Zawahiri was his favorite student. Ayman Zawahiri had memorized the Quran by the time he was 15 years old. So these are prodigies, every one of these. He was a medical doctor who then also was then thrown out of Egypt by Gemal Nasser. He then went and uh, bumped into this man, Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden had an awful lot of money, but didn't know much theology. Ayman Zawahidi had been studied under Hassan al-Banna, had studied under Said Qutb. He knew his theology, and the two amalgamated themselves together, and they joined and created Al-Qaeda. Look what it means. Al-Qaeda means the base, the foundation, going back to the roots. Ayman Zawahidi was just on the news today. Did you hear what he said today? We must do again what we did back in 9-11 because he was the one that ordered that attack on the United States. He's still alive. He's still in Pakistan where Osama bin Laden was killed. They started Al-Qaeda. but They were not welcomed there in the Middle East, and so they moved to Afghanistan. The Taliban invited them. Remember the Taliban? So here is where we have the Taliban. This is where the uh, Indian subcontinent and Egypt now come together created and gave them bases there in Afghanistan, and you know what happened then in 2001. And that's where you all came into the story. That's where you all realized that this was a problem. But see, none of you probably knew the roots for this. You had no idea where it comes from or where it, it, where it began. Meanwhile, in Syria and Iraq, you had two men, Musab al-Zarqawi, who was a, also a, a student under uh, Ayman Zawahiri, under Al-Qaeda, and he was the one that trained up Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was from Iraq. He has a PhD in Islamic theology. This is not a floozy. He has a PhD in Islamic theology and Islamic history. So we're talking about an academic here, and he was the one that created ISIS. 
but he got his training from Musab al Qadr Zarqawi, who is then finally killed by a U.S. drone. Abu Bakr al Baghdadi is still alive. And of course, you know what happened in 2014 when they took over, when came out of Syria, took over Iraq, and went, uh, went city after city. And then he went to Mosul and he put on this robe right here. They're in Mosul, in the city of Mosul. By doing that, he then reinstated the Islamic State, the Khilafat, that had been created by Muhammad back in 624, was eradicated by Kemal Ataturk in 1924, then was reinstated by uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi there in 2014. This is his more recent picture that was just taken a few months ago, and that's what he looks like now. Now, in the UK, you have these two men, Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad and Anjab Chari. They have been responsible for sending 20,000 Europeans to join ISIS since 2014. But I want to talk about these two men right here. These two men I knew personally, especially the man on the right. Asaf Hanif used to come down to Speaker's Corner every Sunday, and uh, suddenly in 2002, he disappeared. We don't know what happened to him. When we asked, he said, well, he, he had gone to Syria to learn Arabic, a good place to, do, to learn Arabic. And then in 2003, on April 20th, also in his picture was on the cover of every newspaper in Britain, possibly here in the United States as well. That day, he and his friend Omar, uh, Omar Sharif, not the actor, another Omar Sharif, went to Israel. They went to uh, Tel Aviv, and there in a uh, discotheque there on the shore named Mike's Bar, they tried to get inside. They were stopped at the door. Asaf Hanif pulled the pin on his jacket, blew himself up, and killed three Israeli guards. Omar Sharif tried to go inside and do the same thing. His jacket was a dud, and he jumped into the ocean and drowned. Do you, any of you remember this? A few of you. It was all over our papers. Well, I was concerned about this because we knew Asaf Hanif personally. He used to be in our crowd. He, I never really got to know him. Sorry, I didn't know him personally, but others on my team knew him personally. So I went down to Speaker's Corner that next Sunday, and I held up his picture on the ladder. I noticed that no one was talking about him, and I held his picture up. And so I have a very loud voice at Speaker's Corner, the loudest one down there, because I grew up in the Himalayas. I have five-liter lungs. I'm only supposed to have three and a half for my size. So I have great lungs, and I'm able to use it to a good capacity when I'm at Speaker's Corner. I said, I want to talk about these two men. And I sucked all the crowds from the other ladders, and they all came right to my ladder. I said, I want all the Muslims front and center. I want to talk to you Muslims specifically. I said, how many of you Muslims would do what these two men did yesterday? And about 30 raised their hands. And then as they raised their hand, I turned to them and said, how many of you would do it right here at Speaker's Corner? How many of you are willing to blow yourselves up for your God right here at Speaker's Corner? And about 15 started punching the air, yelling, Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, alhamdulillah, as they started yelling. And I look at the horror on the faces of the crowds who were looking at this. And I said to the crowd, look at these men. Memorize their faces. This is not a faceless enemy over there in Iraq or Afghanistan. It's right here in London. You've got a problem. Now, that was in 2003. Two years later, in 2005, July 4th, sorry, July 7th. Whew, did I get that wrong? July 7th, 2005. Four young men came and blew themselves up. I don't think they were in that group that day. It didn't matter. I could go do it next Sunday and ask the same question. I would get the same response. We have a problem here in the West, specifically in Europe, more specifically in Britain, more so than any other British country. And still, the British government does not understand who they're dealing with or who they're up against. Both of these men, none of them, neither of them are disenfranchised. They are both educated. Asaf Hanif, just Winston Kingston University, has a degree. Omar Sharif has a wife and three kids. He had everything to lose. Why did they go blow themselves up in Tel Aviv for their God? I talked about Jihadi Dion, Muhammad Edmoazi from Kilburn, just down the road from where I lived. Went to St. John's Woods School, executed British and American journalists and social workers, killed, uh, was finally killed by an American drone. Abu Rumaysa, we knew him personally. He was a former Hindu. He converted to Islam. Then he changed his name to Siddhartha Dar. I'm sorry, his name was Siddhartha Dar. He became Abu Rumaysa. And he became the second jihadi John. He was the one that killed, not using knives, he used guns. The three London girls, they all became the Al Qansa Brigade that they left uh, from London and be, were in charge of you know, in, uh, the women there in Raqqa. And then we have what we call the lone wolf jihadis. 
According to one of the spokesmen, he says, they want to kill a disbelieving American or European, either French, Australian, or Canadian, including the citizens of the countries. Kill him in any manner or way, however it may be, he said. And this happened, this was in 2014 that they were asking for these lone wolves. And that's where Michael Adibalajo came onto the picture. Michael Adibalajo was a Pentecostal Christian, lived in northern London. His parents noticed that he was being, uh, he was work, running with the wrong crowd, so they took him out of the city and they went up to the north, and then he came back to university there in London. Uh, and he met Anjum Chowdhury up on the upper left. Anjum Chowdhury converted him to Islam in 2003. There you can see Anjum Chowdhury right here, and that's uh, uh, Michael Audi Balajo behind him. Michael Audi Balajo then from 2003 to 2013 was radicalized, and by 2013 he then came into the street and knocked this man over with a car and then took out, you can see the blood on his hands, then slit the throats and cut off the head of drummer Rigby. There you can see the body there on the ground and stood around for 16 minutes and talked about it. Did not run away, he was waiting for the police to come so that he could be a shahid, which would be a, uh, a jihad, a shihad means, mean to a martyr for the cause. The police, when they did come, they shot him in the legs. And so at his trial, he gave a piece of paper that had reference after reference from the Quran. It was actually, he was supposed to be sent to his child showing why he did it. And they were all from Surah 9, Ayah 5. Surah 8, Ayah 39, straight out of the Quran. So what caused a Pentecostalist Christian in 2003 to become a radical Muslim in 2013 in 10 years? It was that book, the Quran, influenced by Anjum Chaudhary over here. He's still in prison today, and he's still saying the same thing. He has not retrenched any of his sayings. Khalid Masood, another convert, killed five, wounded 50. His motive, according to the spectator, waging jihad and revenge against Western military action in Muslim countries in the Middle East. That's what they thought until they looked at his phone and listened to the conversations he had before he did this act. Every one of them had nothing to do with that, but more to do with the fact that he, as a Muslim, followed what the Quran said. When I used to go to their meetings, I always noticed that uh, they talked about three stages of dahwah, three stages of mission activity. And the first stage was the pen stage that uh, followed and replicated the stage of Muhammad in Mecca from 610 to 622 uh, when he was, before he moved up to Medina. And this was when he was a minority, he had no control. And so they're saying Muslims in the West, when they come to the West, start with that stage. And by that, they mean by using all kinds of uh, media, such as the internet, CDs, DVDs, to try to push Islam without any control. But then when Muhammad moved to Medina, the, the, next, the two years he was there, the first two years, 622 to 624, he then started introducing laws and institutions. That has already come to Britain. That's the second stage called the scale, scale because of laws. And they would say that much of what we're doing now in Britain is to bring about Islamic unity in the United Kingdom. The third stage was the, what happened between 624 and 632, the last eight years of his life, when he started using the sword. Many of my Muslim friends say that now they're moving into the sword stage with ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab. That's the new, the third stage of Islam, of Dawah, following Muhammad's life. But they all talked about the reasons, and the reasons was fascinating. They would, I would go to their meetings, and they talk about the fact that the West is in decline. And by that, they meant that the West has declined culturally because of loss by national identity, socially because of the dysfunctional families, morally because of what's happening in the movies, TV, music, the sexual promiscuity, spiritually because of the fact that in Britain and in Europe, only 5 to 7% of the populace still go to church, economically because they use capitalism, which is against interest and usury, and politically because democracy is anathema in Islam. These are the reasons why the West has declined. And the reason for that is because Christianity is to blame. Culturally, because the West is now atheist or humanist. Socially, the church has no view on families. Morally, at much all the movies and TV and music have, are now controlled by Hollywood. The church has no control anymore. Spiritually, as I said earlier, very few go to church. And economically, because it supports, uh, the church supports capitalism. And politically, because it has no voice due to separation of church and state. So therefore, if the West is in decline, Christianity is to blame then Islam is the answer because it's the only religion that's a 24-7 religion. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it has an answer for every area of life, spiritually, culturally, morally, in every case. 
He wants to eradicate morality with Sharia law. He wants to eradicate Yuzi with Islamic banking. He wants to eradicate democracy with the caliphate and institute the caliphate. And he wants to eradicate Western militaries by, uh, by use of the Ummah. These signs are now all over uh, London where they're what they call Sharia controlled zones where they want to bring Sharia law to eradicate these vices as they call them. So how pervasive is radicalism? Well, in the, President Obama said that there was only, they only represent a very small minority, possibly only 1%. In the UK, when they did this question back in 2001, they found that 15% of those who responded uh, said that they were radicals, 70% that said that they were nominal, the last 15 said that they were, well, liberal. They asked the same questions a year later in 2002, and then it went, jumped to 25% said that they were radical, taken from the nominal. When they tried it in 2006, so we're talking about five years later, they asked the same question, and this group that had been 15% as radical had now jumped to 43%. Over 40% in Britain have been radicalized in just five years. Now, this surprised everybody, and they haven't done a survey since 2006 for obvious reasons. I think they're scared of what they're going to find. I would suggest that Britain today is almost 60 to 70% radical from my own experience and from what I'm seeing. Not 1% as Obama used to think. And it's not just Obama. Almost all the, the political pundits they say the same thing. In Britain, the British Muslims are accused of boycotting the government's anti-terror program. We hear 99% of the Muslims are peaceful. They are fed up with being targeted as radicals, yet we know of 2,000 UK Muslims that joined ISIS. Another 2,000 were in prison because of the fact they tried to join ISIS. 3,000 are tagged, tagged as dangerous, and 20,000 are under surveillance as radicals. That's a, a total of 27,000 total radicalized Muslims in Britain that we know of that have made themselves known publicly. On the other hand, we only know of 450 that have joined the UK Army. What does that tell you? What's more, since 2006, of the 2,000 Muslims who have been arrested for trying to join ISIS, only 230 have been tipped off by Muslims themselves. That's only 10%. The other 90% were all tipped off by non-Muslims, mostly teachers and social workers, suggesting that much of the Muslim community is not doing its job. When you look at radicalization on a world level, the only time that this has ever been done is 2004, so we're 15 years out of date. But when they asked this question in these four countries, one country to represent each continent, in Turkey, 31% of the populace considered themselves radical. Morocco is 45%. Jordan, it was 55%. And in Pakistan, most troubling, 65%. In that time, they had about 140 million. That's 80 million in Pakistan alone that had become radicalized. That should trouble all of us. Now, the Clarion Project wanted to answer this question, whether it only represent 1%. And they looked at just the number of those who were actually joined, had been part of ISIS, uh, about 40 to 200,000, 40 to 200,000 is the estimate. 30,000 had were members of Hamas, 50,000 members of Hezbollah, 100,000 members of Al-Qaeda, and 20 to 100,000 members of our, yeah, that's Al-Quds force in Iranian Revolutionary Guard. 2,000 young British Muslims that had joined ISIS. And the question was, does that represent only 1%? Well, let's look at some other factors. This came out in the Clarion Project uh, in 2015, four years ago, and they wanted to ask the question. They went to as many Muslim countries as they could to find out about apostasy, whether or not anybody that left Islam should be killed, and that's called the apostasy law, which is in chapter 4, verse 89 of the Quran itself. 79% of those in Afghanistan said they should be killed. In Egypt, it was 86%. In Malaysia, it was 62%. And all Muslims believe apostates, 27% of all Muslims believe that apostates from Islam should be killed around the world. That is a total of 237 million. That's another way of looking at radicalism. Is that just 1%? What about honor killings? When you kill your girl or your son or your daughter, that comes from chapter 18 of the Quran, verse 83 to 101. 345 million Muslims now agree with honor killings. Suicide bombings, 42 uh, French Muslims believe in suicide bombings. 35 British Muslims believe in suicide bombings. American Muslims, 26% of those in the age 18 and 29 years old believe in suicide bombings. Is that just 1%? Sharia and Hudud law, just look at the statistics, 281 million. Why this growth? 
Well, you need to look at two sources. One is the scripture. When you look at scripture, just look at those verses. 149 violent verses in the Quran. How many of you knew this before today? How you would exegete these verses? Well, you need to go back to Muhammad's own example. Look at his biography and look and see what he did to the Jews, as I mentioned earlier, there in Medina. Those who criticized him. I'm a, Asman bin Marwan was one, a poetess who criticized him when he first moved to Medina. He said, who's going to take care of this woman for me? Umar, the blind disciple, went and killed her that night while she was suckling her baby. We know of around 25 people that were killed. And the reason was simply because they criticized Muhammad. Now, I see that my time's up and I need to stop there. But I want to just ask a question. There's an awful lot I could go through. When you look at the Quran, when you look at Muhammad's life, you need to go back to the book and the man, the book and the man. The question I want to ask is who's looking at the book and who's looking at the man? Humanists and atheists in your government does not know how to deal with this because I don't know of anybody in your government that's actually reading the Quran or are talking to radical Muslims. The only people they're talking to are the Ishad Manjis of the world, the ones who live here in the West. And most of those who live in the West who are given airtime, who are on your television screens and who are on your radios, are the Irshad Manjis of the world, not the Anjim Chabris. Until you understand what the Quran is saying, until you look at those 149 verses, until you look and see what ISIS did, if you follow what ISIS did, everything they did, you can find in Scripture. Everything they did, you can find in Scripture. Crucifying, chapter 5, verse 33. Cutting off the heads, chapter 47, verse 4. Killing the apostates, chapter 4, verse 89. The verses go on and on. Cutting off the hands of the thieves, chapter 5, verse 38. Having nothing to do with Christians and Jews, chapter 5, verse 51. Beating the women, chapter 4, verse 34. Taking the women, the Yazidi, as slaves, that's in chapter 4, verse 24. Do you want me to go on? I could go on all night. You have to read the Quran to understand why ISIS exists. You have to understand the Quran and understand Muhammad's life to understand why we have Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab. And the only people that are doing that are people like me and others who are now coming on board to realize that we've got to read the Quran and exegete it as we would exegete the Bible. You've got to exegete it as the Muslims exegete it. You've got to read it face value. You've got to look at the context. You've got to read verse by verse. And you've got to see how it is applied by Muhammad himself. We do that with our own Bibles. Why is it that the rest of the world can't do that with the Quran? Can you therefore understand that the only way to, uh, to take on radical Islam, to, the only way to stop another 9-11 from happening, is if we Christians start engaging with them publicly. But who is engaging with them publicly? Are you? Is there anyone here that's willing to do so? Now, we're doing it. I belong to Fander, uh, Fander, uh, Fander Films, which is the films that I put up on YouTube. You can go up and see them. We're putting up, I'm putting up about a film every three days. And we, these films are engaging publicly with Islam. I use both apologetic and polemics. Let me define terms. Apologetics means to defend the faith. Polemics is to go on the offense. It's much like a football team. You have a defensive team and you have an offensive team. Paul was both an apologist and a polemicist. If you look at Paul's ministry, you will see that he, was, he did defend against the Jews, but he also went in Laodicea, Cappadocia, Berea, and, Le and Ephesus. In every city he went, just look at Acts chapter 17 and 19, and realize that every city he went to, he went right into the synagogue uninvited. He went right up to the Pharisees, and he confronted them with what they had done to the Messiah. They threw him out. They threw him into prison. Sometimes they beat him. Twice they tried to stone him to death. He caused a riot in Ephesus, and they finally killed him in Rome. You don't get beaten up. You don't get thrown into prison. You don't cause riots, and you don't get killed for just having peace. The gospel, by definition, is confrontational. Anytime you say to a Muslim that God entered time and space, you're going to confront them. Anytime you tell a Muslim that God died on the cross, you're going to confront them. But that's the gospel, is it not? And we have to confront Muslims. That's my job. I'm a polemicist. I don't want any of you to, be, to do what I do. Please don't do what I do. But every one of you can defend your faith. And every one of you can defend Jesus Christ. Every one of you can learn apologetics. 
And that's all Christ is asking you to do. Therefore, you need to start engaging with Muslims. They're all around you. They're all here in the Los Angeles Valley. Now, George, if you just raise your hand, look back at George back there. He is one of the best to do that. He is here in Los Angeles. He has Muslims, uh, uh, ministry to Muslim, M to M in his ministry. He has a book table out here. When you go back, look at his book table. I, uh, I want to just show you two books that you can buy right now. This is one by Sam Solomon, The Trojan Horse, Modern Day. This goes and shows you what exactly Islam is doing in the West using the Trojan horse idea. Written by Sam Solomon, a good friend of mine in London. Uh, Sam Solomon was, is considered probably one of the most dangerous Muslims. Uh, when he was a Muslim, he had memorized the Quran in three languages. English, Arabic, his mother tongue, and Urdu, even though he's not from Pakistan. He was head of all the Islamic courts in Pakistan for nine years, even though he's not even a Pakistani. That shows you the prodigy of the man we're talking about. He fell fell in love with Jesus Christ, and he never looked back. And that's why he is so dangerous. Well, this, these are written by him. This is Al-Yahud, the eternal Islamic enmity of the Jews, looking and showing why is it that they have to hate the Jews. These two books are for sale on the book table back there. This weekend, we're having a conference called Our Strong Tower, and you need to talk to George back there who raised his hand. It's on Friday and Saturday. It's right down the road at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. On Friday night, it starts at 6.45. Myself and Dr. David Wood, if you want to find a man who's been on the Internet and probably more people know him than anywhere, anybody else in the Christian world outside of probably Christian Prince, he and I, and along with Dr. Edward Dalcourt, will be engaging with, with Christians for and explaining to you how to deal with Islam, how to identify them, and how to preach the gospel to them. Because every one of these beautiful people needs the gospel. We need to take them away from the Quran back to the Bible. We need to take them away from Allah and back to Yahweh. We need to take them away from Isa and back to Yeshua. We need to bring them home. And we're going to train you how to do that this weekend. That's going to be just down the road at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hill, 645 on Friday evening, and then starting at 945 in the morning Saturday. But you need to sign up. See George at the back. Some of you have asked, how is it that I'm also, uh, how is it we can watch the DVD? This is the DVD that I put together when I was in Britain of the British uh, Museum. God bless the British. They went everywhere, stole everything, and put it into one building called the British Museum. <laughs> and that one museum has more, has more treasures in it about our Bible, concerning our Bible, than any other building on earth. Now, you can walk through that building and not know in anything you're looking at. You won't see anything to help you because the British are not interested in letting you know exactly how powerful those artifacts are. So we put together a tour back in 2000, and we've had over 6,000 people go on this tour. But because it's so popular, they, they finally filmed it, and it's on film. You can buy it for $25. Am I correct? $25 uh, from George at the back. Some of you also want to know how is it you can uh, actually uh, get engaged and actually learn this material. I will be coming back to Veritas Seminary next month. Veritas Seminary is Calvary Chapel Seminary. It's in Costa Mesa, am I correct? Thank you. It's in Costa Mesa, just down the street. And I'll be teaching a whole week of intensive training. There will be 15 different lectures. And I don't speak as fast as I'm speaking now. I do slow down. They'll be every night from the 7th to the 11th of October, every evening from 6.30 to 9.30. These are for master's degree level and also doctorate degree level. But any of you can also take it. If you do want to take it, you don't have to go and do it for credit. You can just come and sit in. So go, come and see me afterwards, and I'll give you the address. The other one last thing I'll just say, if any of you want our prayer card, our prayer card is also on back on the table. Go, and we do need an awful lot of prayer for what we're doing. We have just come across some brand new material that I introduced at Speaker's Corner on Sunday. We are destroying the Quran using historical criticism, using the exact same criticism that we used against the, was used against the Bible. And what we have found in the last 10 years, what we have found in the last five years, and what we have found in just the last two months is incredul incredulous. I will be introducing it at Veritas next month. Meanwhile, you can go up online in, at Fander Films and see exactly what's happening and see the reaction of what happened last week, I mean, sorry, three days ago, at Speaker's Corner when they heard it for the first time. Muslims are not used to this kind of criticism. We are. 
but you need, to, you need to pray with us. If any of you do want to come on our prayer group, go and sign up on the prayer sheet there. And if you want to learn more about how to engage with Islam, we do have the Fander course. You can sign up on the Fander course there on the page. That is a course that starts next Tuesday and goes to April every Tuesday. And it comes to you. You don't go to it. It comes to your laptop. It comes by Zoom webinar. So there's an awful lot of material that you can use to start engaging with Islam. There's quite a few people in the world that want to help you engage with Islam. Islam is growing. It will soon surpass Christianity as the largest religion by 2050. It is not growing by conversion growth. It is growing by biological growth. We need your help. God bless you. I've been here long enough. The man's coming up to take me off. We'll see you next time we're back.